Women are often the first line of health care for a family. That role evolves as her own needs change. We turn another page on life's calendar with health care during a woman's middle years. The doctors are on call tonight. Mama said there'd be days like this. There'll be days like this, Mama said. Funding for On Call is provided in part by Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Broadcasting. Larson Manufacturing is proud to support On Call, starting its 11th year of opening doors for important medical information. And by the South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota. Additional funding provided by Dakota Care, Regional Health, the Brookings Health System, Dr. Mark Bubach with Dakota Allergy and Asthma, the South Dakota American College of Physicians, and Swiftel Communications. Closed captioning for On Call is provided by the generous support of Avera, the Brookings Health System, and Fishback Financial Corporation. Hello, welcome to On Call Television. We are happy to have you joining us tonight in this blizzardy South Dakota weather. Our topic uh, is health care for women in their middle years, but we'll take anything about women. We'll take anything. So we appreciate your calls on these. I'm pleased to introduce to you our guests. Dr. Ellen Hopper did her medical training at Sanford School of Medicine at the University of South Dakota Vermilion and her residency in obstetrics and gynecology at the University of Kansas Wichita or gynecology depending upon who they, who's saying it. She currently practices OBGYN at the Avera Medical Clinic Brookings. Christina Lammers, MD, MPH, Master of Public Health, it, Dr. Lammers did her medical training at the University of Uruguay School of Medicine. She's taught me how to say that right. Uruguay, 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 like a lot of us say. Uruguay and received her master's in public health at the University of Minnesota. She's currently a professor at SDSU in the Department of Nursing and Health Science. But she practiced OBGYN for many years and taught OBGYN at Uruguay. Mm -hmm. You, the home audience, are also participants in our discussion. We are pleased that you are watching and know that you will take away valuable health information. Our guests will entertain all questions about women's health, particularly during the middle years. Call in your questions to 1-888-376-6225. You may also email them to questions at oncalltelevision.com. Welcome. Thank, Thank you for joining you. us. Thank you. I, I have to say that this is a snowy day and that we had formerly planned to have Dr. Uh, Patty Peters and Deb Soholt, uh, nurse practitioner, as our guests. And the weather prevented it from happening. And so last night, in a fit of panic, I called these two good friends and they said, happy to do it. They're, and they looked at me and they said, oh, so we're plan B. <laughs> so that, but so much appreciate you tonight uh, joining us about uh, talking about women in middle years or any women's issues. Yep. So Thank you. tell us, Ellen, you are uh, originally from what home? I'm originally from Pierre, South Dakota. So you're a Pierre girl. I'm a Pierre girl. Mm -hmm. And then trained at the U.S. at USD School of Medicine. Was it Sanford at that time, or um, it had changed my senior year? Yep, okay. in 2007. And then you went down to uh, Kansas. Yes, to Wichita. To Wichita. And did Kansas. my four years of OBGYN training there. Right. Mm -hmm. And then back here. And back to South Dakota. And it's been you're, you've been here for. About a year and a half. Yeah. Yeah, so, going on too. And so I must add this. 
I know that uh, your partner, OBGYN Dr. Goodvangen, is out of town, likely not going to make it home tonight. Yes. And you are on call. I am on call, on call. You're on call, on call. <laughs> and so we have your phone, right, sitting yes. there. And so those of you who want to call her just for the fun of it, please don't. <laughs> yeah, thank you. But what uh, we want, we've told the OBGYN department and ERs that you are here and ready, but if, mm -hmm. you know, if you don't need to call her, don't, if you could That's help right. it. That's right. But you're, if you need to take that call, I want you to take it, and we'll just, we'll let, we'll, Christina and I will handle it, and we'll carry on, and you can just have a kind of a quiet conversation in this. Perfect. Perfect. Christina, now you're a, from Uruguay, and uh -huh. you practice medicine, and you came to Brookings because? Well, we kind of took a chance, and my husband was offered a job at the at SESU as an extension. He's a, the dairy extension specialist. Um, and um, the College of Nursing um, needed somebody to talk about and to teach public health, and it was a very good fit for me. So. And would you have you thought about going back to practice medicine? Sure. Yeah. That I miss that a lot. I have to go back to Uruguay to practice medicine. So the so rules in, in the United States are really difficult for foreign people to come here. Well, I think they are fair, but. You have to do a lot of work. Yes. So it would be another four years. It will be another residency for me to do. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, well, if you decide to do a residency, we hope that you would do that and then come back to Brookings yeah, and practice absolutely. as a partner. Yes. That, that's exactly I what I wanted that. to do. Yes. <laughs> that would be to great. To stay in that. South Dakota. So, yeah. so we, we would love that to happen. <clears throat> and I want to, uh, before we go any further uh, on the stories, uh, I have a skull in my my office, which, uh, as uh, you know, is a physician. It's something that you use to illustrate points and so on and so forth. And I acquired it in my lifetime, and it's a real skull. And so Christina is, sits over in the corner, right next to that skull, and and um, has said, "Well, it makes me think about my experience in uh, in a." Skull. So let's I had I had one exactly like that one except that mine didn't have the two teeth. Tooth, tooth gun. Didn't have any teeth. <laughs> no. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, but now, how did you get your skull? You got to tell the story oh, quickly, no, no, very no, quickly. No, no, no. They are going to put me in jail. I don't know. That's legal in the United States. In the United States. I didn't kill anybody. You no. didn't. But <laughs> no. But they they have graveyard people. They do. They they have. This is a very traditional thing that they did when I went to medical school in the eighties, late. Uh, 70s and 80s, and when we were medical students, uh, you are supposed to go and pick up your own skeleton to study. Oh. So, uh, so you have to go to the to get your little slip of paper and go to the cemetery. Oh. And um, people who die and are not claimed after two years, uh, they become subject of study. Uh -huh. So medical students can go and get your own skeleton, which you need to clean uh -huh. thoroughly. Oh, and isn't that an amazing <laughs> story? So it's wow, a, that's it's dedication a, to the studies. Oh, actually, <laughs> all of us. This is in Uruguay, right? Not Uruguay. in the U.S.? Right. Mm -hmm. No. Are they still doing that, you think? I don't think so. I have a nephew who is a medical student, and um, I don't think they're doing that so much now. Oh, anyway, you use that uh, <laughs> that in your in your your studies and in your yes, training, and yes. that's what it's all about. Yeah. Uh, what well, we're talking middle years, and there's a lot of things that happen in a person as they reach their middle years. Mm -hmm. uh, hormonal changes. Mm -hmm. Describe the hormonal changes a little bit, the two of you, please. Well, as you age, your ovarian function declines. And um, once your ovarian function is completely depleted, you stop having periods and you go through menopause. Menopause is a clinical diagnosis where you, um, you have to go a full 12 months without having any periods. Um, and at that point, when that ovarian function, your, your um, ovarian function is depleted, you have a lack of estrogen. Um, and so that, that change in your hormones can cause all sorts of different symptoms. Um, now, let me ask you, to, before we go any further on the physiology of it all, there is a test that you can see uh, where FSH goes sky high, and then you can say, yes, you are depleted of estrogen. Could you explain that a little bit? Um, well, 
as you age, your, your FSH level does increase. It's not a great test unless you're comparing it to an estrogen level um, because you could be, I mean, at 40, your FSH is typically higher. higher. Mm -hmm. um, but you really have to compare it to the estrogen level as well. So yes, you're, it's a follicle stimulating hormone, we call it, that your brain tells your ovaries to stimulate those eggs to ovulate. And once that level is very high, um, you, you go through menopause and your estrogen, of course, is very low. Because the estrogen's low and the FSH says, oh, <coughs> kick, come on, kick in, right. we need more estrogen. Right. Estrogen keeps going low. Exactly. Come on, and it gets exactly. higher and higher. Exactly. So uh, anything else about the physiology that's interesting that we should share right now to the public? Let's talk about the symptoms. Christina. Oh. Well, there are plenty of them, but that's not similar. I mean, it's not equal to everybody. Every woman is, is different, actually. But you can start having different type of symptoms, like hot flashes or night sweats, or you become a little moody, you cry a lot, you feel mm -hmm. um, kind of sad that sometimes, you have problems sleeping. Mm -hmm. Those are moments. Vaginal symptoms. dryness, pain mm -hmm. with intercourse, those are all yeah. symptoms as well of yeah. estrogen deficiency. And your skin is drier maybe, mm -hmm. that's true. Mm -hmm. And you may have maybe more urinary infections, cystitis mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. some type of things. Well now, for the longest time, and I was a big part of this, and you and I discussed this earlier, <laughs> yes, we you did. were a big part of this too. Yes. We replaced <clears throat> estrogen when that happened so that women didn't have those symptoms. And we willy-nilly did that, particularly because we were trying to prevent the osteoporosis that sometimes occurs mm -hmm. as estrogens are depleted. Mm -hmm. That stopped abruptly. Um, why is that, Helen? Um, so there were several studies, the most, um, famous is the Women's Health Initiative, which um, studied women with ad back hormone therapy, both estrogens and estrogens and progesterone combinations. Um, and we found that um, there, were, there were increased risks with giving these women specific doses of those medications, the estrogens, the estrogen and progesterone only. Um, <clears throat> there were risks of um, DVT, so blood DVT clots. Blood clots mm -hmm. in the legs. Yep, blood clots, breast cancer, um, cardiovascular disease. Heart attacks. Heart attacks, strokes, mm -hmm. um, yeah. all those things. And you know, so, I think that was one of the main reasons why they did also this study, because mm -hmm. uh, back in the, you know, 90s, that when we started to replace hormones and to treat people with mm -hmm. hormones, um, we were trying to reduce the cardiovascular risk right. because right. you see that w when we are in the menopause years, women will get kind of increased this heart increased heart mm -hmm. attacks, mm -hmm. and that was attributed to the fact that estrogens were not protecting right. women, so we catch up with men. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But after the study, and it shows that actually the, the cardiovascular risk were not reduced, you say, well, wow, what right. are we doing? Right. So, what are we doing? Right. But I would add, in defense of the, the whole thing, that the increased risk of, of ovarian cancer, for example, was, I think, of 10,000 women, there was, instead of 14 ovarian cancers, there were 20 or some, right. some very mm -hmm. infinitesimal small <coughs> risk. The breast cancer was similar like that. It changed just a tiny right. little bit, not enough mm -hmm. that you would really actually notice it except mm -hmm. if you were doing 10,000 people. Right. 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 Yeah. And, the, and the other thing, they were using very high doses of estrogen and progesterones, and they were in older women, so they were fairly remote from menopause. I mean, menopause, the, the average age in our country is 51. And these women were often in their 60s. I think yeah. they went as high as 69. I think that the, yeah, where 64 was the average age. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. at 64, actually, your cardiovascular risk is already right. pretty right. high right. because of the Six, age. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah. So, so really, I looked at the studies when it came out, and I went, oh, pff, 
big deal. It's mm -hmm. hardly any. In fact, it says there's a there's a lot of safety. Mm -hmm. um, I think the big the big problem that I see is it did increase clotting, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and certainly clotting is a real deal, and mm -hmm. it's a lot more. And that's right. where I think the heart attacks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that came. could that yes. could be it. Yeah. Anyways, there are so many other things that you can do to reduce the cardiovascular risk of, of a mm -hmm. woman right. that you know, actually estrogens or hormone treatment right. was not, you know, the idea the maybe thing. Mm -hmm. Well, we were thinking a that. pill could do all these things right. when we should be doing <laughs> lifestyle changing. Right. Yeah, that's right. true. So do we, we don't really prescribe much estrogen, progesterone, hormone anymore? Well, they are indications. I mean, what we are not doing is that in, in the 90s, we did that a lot because we tell women, you know, you will feel much better, you will sleep better, you will not have hot flashes, you know, you will not have so many cardiovascular disease. And you will keep mm -hmm. your feminine. <laughs> right, right. But now, actually, the, the really kind of um, indication is to treat uh, uh, menopausal symptoms. Really yes. bad. Severe. Yes. Yes. Severe. Yes. Severe hot flashes and night sweats that cannot mm -hmm. be treated or reduced. And we have different forms of treatment. Yeah. So they were all taking oral medications. We have transdermal patches now. We have much lower doses. So hormones are okay. They can be safe in certain circumstances. Yeah. I think as long as you've got a heightened level of awareness to watch out for clotting and do mm -hmm. the things to prevent but clotting. But as, as, as Helen said, I mean, you can use uh, kind of vaginal Mm -hmm. tablets mm -hmm. or, or gel. Vaginal. Yes, mm -hmm. so the absorption is not so systemic, it's right. very little. It's not right. into the whole so body, you, but you just treat, there. Right. Yeah, unless you have to treat the hot flashes and then you might need mm -hmm. a little bit. Are there need, For instance, um, speaking of the vaginal estrogens, I had a patient who had severe atrophic vaginitis, so just a, a vaginitis from having so much lack of estrogen. She was young, she was premenopausal when she had a breast cancer. Um, so had her, her surgery, her radiation, um, ended up having a hysterectomy and removal of the ovaries as well to help pr protect her um, breast health and came to me um, with just, you know, not able to have intercourse. She's young, um, you know, in her 50s and just suffering every day with this horrible vaginitis and I called her oncologist and you know we talked I mean her symptoms warrant a vaginal preparation for hormone therapy you know that doesn't mm -hmm. significantly increase her risk of breast cancer recurrence right That's so true. I think I think it's important for women to know that too that and was when were you successful <coughs> yes. did it make a difference yes yeah. Oh, oh my and goodness! Talk about yeah. an appreciative patient. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. An appreciative life. patient's yes. husband. Yes. The husband yes. was yes. very yes. appreciative. Yes. Sorry, That's I just true. speak from the perspective. <laughs> well, uh, and but still, people have a lot of menopausal symptoms, and they're 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 reluctant to use the the hormonal treatment. Mm -hmm. I mean, is there ways to to give hormones, but that aren't hormones? I mean, there's a lot of of uh, suggestion to use. Uh, hormones from soybeans or hormones from other sources, are they safer or do you think that there's any difference? Um, most of the studies suggest that those those sort of herbal preparations or um, you know non-FDA approved preparations are not any better than placebo. Um, the thing that concerns me about using some of the like bioidentical hormones and things, um, herbal preparations, is that we don't know what the dose of estrogen is in those. It may be different, you know, from one bottle to the next, or one preparation to the next. Um, we, you know, so we don't we haven't studied any of the risks really associated with those. My like, sense, and my thought is, uh, it's probably the same risk as the uh, the, the the regular. Uh, 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 pharmaceutical version which are very low and if a person gets relief and that's what they want to use mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. okay but but you know there are other medications that are not hormones so non-hormonal thing we got about a minute okay yeah, what, what are they things. Uh, you can use for example to treat hot flashes many respond to antidepressant mm -hmm. the SSRI mm -hmm. they, they, for yeah. some reason they get it's not that it's a, they're treating the depression no, they just have they, relief of their yeah. symptom mm -hmm. Any particular SSRI that uh, you like? Lexapro, for example, Citalopram. Effexor. Effexor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
a variety yeah. of them really okay. do help those. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And also yes. help with sleeping problems mm -hmm. and so forth. So. All right. Well, we're, 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 we're going to address this and we're going to turn to this uh, for now. The most obvious normal event that happens to women in their middle years is menopause. We're going to listen in on a conversation among four friends who are going through this experience. A hot flash is really weird in that you can be just going about your regular business. Let's say I'm sitting at my desk, I'm working on a letter to a prospect, and then suddenly just like that, it's like, like somebody turned a heat lamp on you and you're just, just flush with heat. And, and, and your forehead starts beating up with sweat, and I have a little fan at my desk that I turn on, and, and so I'll have the fan blowing at me, I'll take my blazer, you know, and, and now I have to, when I, when I get dressed these days, I can't wear sweaters anymore. I always wear something that's short-sleeved with a blazer over it in case I need to take off my blazer because I get so hot. And then, the, and then you cool down in a matter of, I don't know, maybe a minute or two minutes, and, and then I turn my fan off and put my blazer back on, and that goes on and off throughout the day. I, uh, I think I've probably had symptoms of menopause for a couple years. I am 52, and um, I have been a very warm-blooded personality my entire life. I haven't worn sweaters for probably 20 years. But now I kind of feel like um, I might be on the downhill slide of this menopause thing. My, t my thermostat has actually gone down. I have a jacket and a scarf on today, which I, I can hardly ever do. Um, I, I did experience hot flashes, but they weren't, it didn't seem like they were as intense as what I was hearing from other people. I have a friend who used to have to get up during the night and change her pajamas because she would be the sweating, she would be yeah. so wet from sweating. I never experienced that. I'd wake up and think, oh, I should throw the covers off, but it was never that mm -hmm. uncomfortable. And I'm not experiencing any of those now. So I'm kind of thinking, I'm hoping I'm on the downhill slide of it. Mine is similar. I'm 59 and maybe for about four years have had symptoms, but mostly just the hot flashes. And I like the hot flashes because I like to be hot. So like when I wake up at night with a hot flash, like, or, you know, I'm like, Some oh, this feels, crazy. this feels great. <laughs> Life gave her lemons and she made this. lemonade. Um, I'm usually able to just keep going. You know, when it happens during the day, I'm fortunate enough that, you know, it is brief. And in my line of work, I, you know, I'm busy with the kids and uh, at, the, at the clinic. I don't have to stop and strip down, but in the house, oh yeah, the layers come off. You just hear research, um, you know, shows that, you know, estrogen helps or something else helps or this, and then, then you find out there's a study that it causes breast cancer and then, mm -hmm. and I don't know what to believe anymore. So I, I didn't want to take anything, be, and my, my OBGYN said that if it's not impacting your life severely, then it's best to stay off any kind of hormone, you know, treatments, I guess. So, mm -hmm. so I'm managing. Please call in your questions or comments about tonight's topic. Call 1-888-376-6225 or you could email them to questions at oncalltelevision.com. And you make this show, so give us your calls. We appreciate the ones who've called already. Here's an email. It is it necessary to take a calcium supplement if your annual physician an, uh, annual physical indicates one is not deficient? does not have osteoporosis, nor family history of calcium deficiency, and bone scan indicates good bone. Comments? That's a good question. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know, but I would suggest that if that person is, has a good intake of calcium with, the, with her diet, I would say that, you know, just make sure that you get enough dairy products, enough food with calcium, mm -hmm. and maybe it's not as necessary. I'm with you there. Yeah, uh, I agree. There's, there's new data about vitamin D and calcium being harmful potentially mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and I know the data on calcium potentially uh, damaging arteries and mm -hmm. calcifying mm -hmm. things so the preliminary data is no more calcium supplement except take it in your food mm -hmm. take it in your food mm -hmm. but what do you think is more important uh, any of these uh, osteoporosis pills or injections or medicines or what about walking and appropriate mm -hmm. exercise? I think that's, yeah, yeah. I, I agree. I mean, I think they're finding 
more and more issues with the medications and mm -hmm. um, are recommending shorter therapy on those medications. So I think it's important to yeah. really um, weigh balance. the risks yeah. and benefits, you know. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah. I've not been prescribing the medicine. Yeah. 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 And they are showing that even people who are not in menopause, but if you exercise, and especially those who strength training. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Exercise, exercise, it's, there well, it is. Yes. No, you need that. don't take calcium supplement. And uh, you know that's my, my take. Unless mm -hmm. you are not allowed to take right. food with Lactose calcium. Lactose intolerant or something like that where you're not getting any calcium, then I would. Yeah. There's more ways to get calcium though than milk products. Right. Right. Yes. Uh, Sioux Falls, this viewer had a hysterectomy fairly early and was put on Premarin for hot flashes. About five years ago, she was put on Norethindrone, five milligrams. If she goes off the medicine, is she likely to have hot flashes again? Ellen. Um, she may. Typically, I mean, most women um, stop having hot flashes after about five to six years, um, and that's a long period but some women have them much longer. So she, she may go off. Some people will taper off of the, of the hormone replacement and see if that helps. So Primarin sort of is one version of estrogen. Right. And, yeah. and it's Primarin because it comes from pregnant mare urine, Primarin. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. But uh, so norethindrone, what is that? Is a uh, progesterone. progesterone. Mm -hmm. Which I don't know if it's, she needs maybe. So let, explain why estrogen why progesterone and what's the, can you do it really quickly oh, and well. simply? Simply, uh, estrogen and progesterone are the, the, the hormones that we usually have to regulate our cycle. And the, the thing is that you cannot um, treat with estrogen without giving a progesterone if, the, if you have your uterus intact. Right, because to it protect helps, cancer. It helps bring the, sloughs the, the, the lining of the uterus. Yes. And, but it'll bring so you your menstrual if you, cycle. Yeah, so if you have your, your uterus in place, then you need the progesterone to protect from uterine cancer. Right. How can husbands be supportive of wives through menopause? Great question. Oh. <laughs> Let me ask the women. <laughs> Well, she's too oh, young. <laughs> yeah, I have somebody just in the control yes, room in door. Oh boy, oh boy. <laughs> just say yes, dear. Just say yes. That's exactly, yeah. but that's so difficult to do, to get. I, I, uh, I think that um, we all need to support each other through times when the other one is uncomfortable. Yes. And yeah, may not true. be in the best of moods. Mm -hmm. And men also go through menopause. I mean, they, they there is an andropause. Andropause. Mm -hmm. You so. asked me about that. I, <laughs> I'm trying to remember what that meant. But um, <laughs> so, it's a different. Guys are different than gals. You know? Mm -hmm. Have you noticed that? Yeah. That is good. Just it's a, a good it's thing. It's a good thing, isn't it? You know, there there is this whole thing about women and men are the same, they're the same, everything is the same, and yet, okay, well, really, they are different. Mm -hmm. Pretty different. Mm -hmm. uh, Sioux Falls, best in new techniques regarding incontinence. What can we do ourselves, and at what point do we need to do something medically? Ooh, I love this question, and this is an important one. Why do people get incontinent? Well, there are different types of incontinence, um, first of all. So some of the, there are stress incontinence and And hey, we're talking urine leakage, right? right? right. Incontinence is urine right. leaking when you don't want it to be leaking. Right. So, and so stress incontinence is when... You're lifting something heavy, coughing, sneezing, and um, it running, and you leak yeah. urine mm -hmm, okay. because and of the, the other, stress. And the other is urge incontinence. Urge incontinence. Which means... You feel that urge, you try to make it to the bathroom, you don't get there, you leak. Yeah. Or you hear water running, yes. or it's yeah. cold, or right. you, you get, get wet. You get the urge, right. and mm -hmm. it's wet. Yeah. So some of it is with, okay, so, and where's the difference? What is the difference? What makes, is one related to the fact that, that you don't have the strength to hold it back Mm -hmm. And the other yeah. is related so, to something. So, so one it. is a little bit more structural um, and and related to your anatomy. Um, so your urethra sort of has a, a hypermobility; it moves easily, and that can be yeah, that's because genetics. The, the it can be from are, are really soft. Right. That, right. Which one is that? That's stress and contrast. So the ones that have the cough, uh, laugh. Sneeze, mm -hmm. lift a, lift a, lift something heavy incontinence really would benefit most from Kegels. Kegels. So tell mm -hmm. me what Kegels are. 
Um, <laughs> go ahead. You tell us what Okay, you well, uh, those are exercises. Uh, the same way that you exercise your muscles in your arms or legs, you, you exercise uh, in muscles in your pelvis. Hello. Lean forward and just keep telling me about Kegels. Okay, yeah. well, uh, so you exercise your, the muscles in your pelvis. So yeah. you try you to use them. So you need to learn how to do that. It's not, you know, something that you usually do, but um, you learn how to do that using some type of um, feedback mechanism. It could be feedback mechanism, and, it, and there are also some type of um, devices. devices that you use that help you concentrate your your uh, force, your strength, down in your pelvic muscles. Now, what I have heard uh, for Kegels is. Uh, that you just tighten those muscles as uh -huh. tight as you can and relax and then you relax it and you do it slowly like mm -hmm. you're going up an elevator yeah. or, mm -hmm. instead of tight yeah. so you tighten slowly mm -hmm. and then you relax and yes. you should be doing it all the times of the day like 2000 mm -hmm. times 200 times exactly. a day exactly 200 I mean, times a day yeah that's that's true and also you can use uh, some hormonal treatment locally it can help with urine leakage because the same way that the vagina kind of dries out, dries out yes. the muscles, yeah. really a little bit of estrogen can help okay. also. Okay. All right. And we have a caller from Sioux Falls, Night Sweats, Hot Flash is still at 88 years of age. Christina, have oh, you heard anything? Well, I've never heard 80 something, but yeah. I have had some patients like and 70s. You have? Uh, unfortunately, I thought that after a few years, the hot yeah. flashes yeah. will go away. But for some women, you can still have some hot flashes yep. for many, many years. Right. And, uh, 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 the, do you think estrogen? Sure. Gee, I don't know what I would try. I would try the SSRIs, the antidepressant group for this person, I think. Huh? Mm -hmm. Are we okay? Are you going to be able to stay? Oh, okay. Good. Right. Very good. <laughs> so, 88-year-old uh, woman with menopausal symptoms, hot flashes. Have you ever, have you, have you heard of anyone this late? Um, I, yeah, I, 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 I mean, I, it can go forever. It, it, it can, can happen, yeah. yeah. Can. And anything you'd suggest, try the SSRIs, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. Anything else? There was something else that, uh, oh, I know, uh, a trial of gabapentin at night. Mm -hmm. Have you heard mm -hmm. that one? Mm -hmm. Gabapentin, gabapentin or, or clonidine. Or clonidine, clonidine, clonidine if they sure. have yeah. high blood pressure, especially. Yeah, clonidine is a good option. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Uh, here, the uh, can an IUD cause early menopause? No. No. Mm -mm. No, it cannot. Well, well what can, does an IUD do? But I mean, you know, maybe maybe she's um, what she's talking about is that there are some IUDs that have this progesterone, uh -huh. and it can really maybe reduce your your flow. your flow of blood uh -huh. so maybe you get l very little or none right. but you not can, menopause you can, there the marina iud that has progesterone on it many women do not get periods right. while that iud is in but that doesn't put you at higher risk for going into menopause no. early or mm -hmm. anything like that and you still you still typically yeah. ovulate um, you just don't have the the blood flow because your lining is so thin from the progesterone so, do you, so are, you, no are, you, are you a fan of this kind of IUD? I love it. Because? <laughs> I, I agree. <laughs> why, well, why do you like it? Um, it acts locally, so you don't have quite as many systemic side effects as so you would with like a pill. Systemic meaning the whole body. Right. It's just right, right there, so right. It's, it avoids a lot of right. total body. Um, less risk um, because you don't have those systemic side, uh, side effects. You don't, you're not on an estrogen. It's a great option for people who have a history of blood clots that can't be on an estrogen. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you don't get your period. Yeah. That's not a bad thing. <laughs> not a bad no, and it's good for perimenopausal women because, mm -hmm. you know. Perimenopausal because, meaning be just the late I mean, normal, but uh, well, before you start I will the say that maybe 40 something. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Now, uh, sometimes, sometimes people get very heavy menstrual cycles in their menopause. Why is that? And that's because. Progesterone I mean, is le less? Uh, progesterone is, is less. Mm -hmm. It's kind of not functioning very well, so you don't have that balance with progesterone, so you have more estrogen compared to progesterone, so mm -hmm. your lining gets thicker and thicker, and then, you know, when that cannot work anymore, then you have your, your bleeding, and mm -hmm. so, 
And the yeah. Mirena can help with that a lot. Right. Yep, it, helps, it can help with that abnormal bleeding. And of course, you have to remember, if you haven't gone through menopause, there's potential that you'll, you can still ovulate. So if you're not using something for birth control, yeah. you like might just have a about, boobs. Yeah, you yeah. might just have yes. a baby. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, yeah I had Which delivered a few babies. Yeah. Babies are great, yeah. but... <laughs> A result of menopause. <laughs> when you're They're a little harder yet. Yeah. yeah. So um, no, if, no. So we're talking about heavy menstrual cycles sometimes during menopause. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's say after menopause and someone has bleeding. Mm -hmm. uh, after menopause, what does bleeding after menopause say to the patient, or should say to the patient? Um, it's a big red flag. You, you always need to be evaluated if you have bleeding after menopause because the big risk is that there's a cancer um, growing and so it needs to be evaluated. Now it's not always a cancer. You can have benign polyps in the uterus. You can have just a little bit of bleeding from your, your lack of estrogen again um, and that lining gets a little bit fragile so it can bleed just a little bit but it always needs to be evaluated because of the higher risk of cancer. So it's not normal to bleed after menopause. Mm -mm, mm -mm. So you, it, it used to be, I remember the OBGYN doctor from Emory University, he would stand there in front of all of his OBGYN residents and the med students, and that was what I was. And he would say, post-menopausal bleeding means DNC, yeah. <laughs> which means dilation and curette. Yeah, yeah. You would or it, scrape it mm -hmm, out mm -hmm. and make sure it's not cancer, right? Right, right. We're not doing DNCs anymore, like no, that anymore. Right. Are we, we doing some DNCs? We do some DNCs. Um, yeah. But we have an in-office procedure that's just that's a little pipel, a little catheter that we slide through the cervix and it takes a biopsy that way. So you don't have to be yeah. put under in the operating room and have the risk associated with surgery. You can do a simple in-office yeah, And, and procedure. you can also put a scope up there and look around, yeah, right? You can yep. do hysteroscopies. Yep. Mm -hmm. did, did you do hysteroscopies in Uruguay? Yes, sure. Yeah. sure. We do yeah. that. You did all these things. You were telling me about your experience taking care of um, young women. Oh, yeah, because oh. my specialty was adolescent OBGYN. And what, and that means Sitting down <laughs> with other colleagues, and uh, we have like a team with a psychologist. Mm -hmm. So we wanted them to <coughs> feel comfortable coming with, you know, to talk with a with a doctor, and you know, do all that prevention, and you know, the preventing of getting pregnant, exactly, the and of STIs infections. and that that sort of thing. S so. STIs. STIs. Sexually transmitted, transmitted infections. infections. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so that's one thing. Plus, they say that there is no more stressed individual in all of our society, in all of our ages, than a young woman, because they have so much of a burden. Mm. Have you heard that before? Yeah, yeah sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Here's from uh, Menno. Uh, use reclass for osteoporosis. Is it considered safe after menopause? Reclassed. Do you have any comment about reclass? Uh, I think I it's have heard about it. I have no experience using that medication, but... It would, it's safe after menopause. I think yeah. so. It's, it, what, how does it work? It's, it's a biologic, is it mm -hmm. not? So I would I, have to look up the okay. generic name because I don't know the... But it is one of the biologics. Uh, I think it, my personal bias is Exercise, exercise, exercise. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's a way to strengthen right. your bones, and I really hate to take I think on that, yeah, medicines of any I kind. I totally agree, but I think that what that is is, you know, once you diagnose, men, I mean, osteoporosis or a woman has right, osteoporosis, right. It, it, it really then stops the it's, whole it's process. Then it's really helpful, mm -hmm. and I think that's uh, it's safe. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's true. And. Uh, and I agree that uh, there's a time and a place for all of these. Mm -hmm. True. But the new medicines, uh, uh, the Fosamax, for example, uh, has, we're now at a point where they're out five years and we're finding microscopic mm -hmm. uh, fractures in the mm -hmm. bones of people on, uh, on, uh, on these and we're, we're having to stop mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. Now we don't know, we really don't know if we can restart them or not. Right. The people who are selling it are saying, yes, you can after a year right, or so. Right. But I don't know that we have the data. Mm -hmm. What do you think? I think, well, I think it was it was a big hit for all women with osteopenia. So you weren't quite osteoporotic, but you were trying to prevent, you know, the patient from getting there. And now that we have this new data, we're reassessing 
risk fracture scores, you know, and I think that's important because if you, you may be osteopenic, but if your risk, you know, your 10 year risk of fracture is low, then what's the benefit of putting you on a medicine that could potentially be harmful in five yeah. years? Right. Time, and, you and, know? and my guess is that some of these people also were low in vitamin D. Uh, uh, and when you're low on vitamin D, it isn't osteoporosis, uh, uh, it's, it's osteo, I'm blocking on the word, but it's a different kind of problem. Mm -hmm. And you, it, you can do harm if you're, mm -hmm. if you're going in that other direction. You need to make sure people, first mm -hmm. of all, foremost, we need to look at their os vitamin D level mm -hmm. and see if they're here. Mm -hmm. Especially in South Dakota. Where, where there's no <laughs> sun, yeah. where has our sun gone? Yeah. Yeah. Beersford, any medicine, any medication for incontinence that does not have pr eye problems. Mm -hmm. So I think the incontinence medicine she's talking about are these uh, atropine-like mm -hmm. medications. Mm -hmm. Talk um, about those. Um, the hmm. classic mm -hmm. ones are... I, I know the, the, uh, the Vesicare. Vesicare mm -hmm. is, a ver is one and probably mm -hmm. yeah. uh, one of the better. Mm -hmm. uh, long-acting, uh, uh, parasympathetic uh, blockers. So what you end up is you don't have the peristalsis mm -hmm. of the bladder. Mm -hmm. right. it, it's the muscle of the right. bladder a, is irritated if you want. And so in, in my sense is it isn't, it isn't the people who have bladders that are leaky because their muscles are weak, it's the people who have spastic bladders right. that th these work. Mm -hmm. But those are a lot rarer than... Well, actually, they, I think the combination combination of both. I mean, both of them occurs more are are more common in my experience, at least. Ellen, you look you look like don't get me don't, don't take even, me there. Yeah, don't take me there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, so my it's so my complicated. Every, it's, it's, yes, it is. It is. It's not my, an easy diagnosis. <laughs> no, I mean it it's requires a special lot of testing studies. And, yes. Yeah. My basic uh, plan on this is to say that every one of those medications that are used in a parasympathetic way right. that work, all of them have major side effects, mm -hmm. constipation mm -hmm. because they stop mm -hmm. all your bowels right. working, they stop all of the parasympathetics, mm -hmm. and dry your mouth, eyes, dry, dry mouth, eyes. dry eyes, mm -hmm. and that's just one of the problems. Mm -hmm. None of these medicines are any better, mm -hmm. I don't think. Mm -hmm. Maybe Vesicare. Yeah. But they're all expensive. Mm -hmm. The generics mm -hmm. that are available mm -hmm. are the shorter acting and mm -hmm. they, they have the Well, and I think you have to remember too that there are other medical diseases, you know, that can potentially be causing this. So you can't just jump right to the medicine before a complete evaluation right. of... I, you know, I, I totally agree with, yeah. with you. I think that the, the one thing that maybe we need to remember is that there are other other problems that can actually cause mm -hmm. what we call menopausal symptoms. So it can be mm -hmm. menopause, mm -hmm. but we really need to look at, mm -hmm. you know, kind of rule out mm -hmm. like other things, other things yeah. like a urinary infection or any other bladder you know, tumors. Blood, yes, or stones. other hormonal thyroid disease. Yes, yes. yes. It's not is. a simple deal. No, I know. it's not yeah. a clear cut deal. And you know, I would say here is a good time to say the fact that we can treat half of the people who have incontinence with Kegel's exercises if people would do it, but they don't want to. They'd rather take a pill. And my, my sense is that in urinary incontinence, we should really do the exercises, do the Kegel exercises and your overall exercises. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, a pill should be the last, mm -hmm. last choice. Yeah. Clear Lake, doctor, any reminders for, oh, remedies for irritable bowel. That's a question. A lot of women have irritable bowels. <laughs> that's, a, age, that's another difficult. <laughs> yeah. I have a patient who has a very irritable bowel, and I mm -hmm. talked with her today, and she was kind of disgusted with the gastroenterologist who didn't have any better answers than I had had, mm -hmm. which is, you know, try off of milk and mm -hmm. and vary your diet and see if you make sure that you don't have celiac disease and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. go from there. Any other great ideas? You know, I have, I have read, um, and this is an odd treatment, but I've read that um, Depolupron can actually really? maybe help with irritable bowel in yeah. some cases, well, but yeah, it, you have to get in, effects, yes, and that would, you know, that puts you into menopause temporarily. It just and blocks. You can't, yeah, you can't blocks. use it for a long time, yeah. but. And if for a guy, 
that will completely yeah. wipe out any sexual right. function. Exactly. Right. Yeah. You know, some of, uh, are, is the implication that that's a testosterone uh, uh, blocker in women. You know, women have a significant amount of testosterone mm -hmm. in their body. Mm -hmm. That's an, I, I have seen before that sometimes for very, very, very difficult to treat vul vulva vaginitis, vulvitis, mm -hmm. and kind of um, very dry and, and even painful, they can use a cream based on some testosterone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I've also heard that uh, an extra test was a treatment that was very popular for a while when we were doing estrogen mm -hmm. supplement, but women noticed their lack of interest anymore mm -hmm. and they wanted some interest, they would get estrogen with some testosterone mm -hmm. and their sexual drive came back to some degree. What's your comments on that? Well. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> you keep giving me All that these. look. I don't prescribe that one. Um, because? Well, I mean, there are risks with yeah. testosterone, too. And I think, yeah, we, I mean, just to help with libido, we don't have. A lot of good. Maybe yeah. there are other kind of, you can go to a, a specialist, in a sexologist, or have some type of. There are people who are sexologists. Work in, yeah. I know. Mm -hmm. They'll help people yeah. with their sexual mm -hmm. activities. That's, if you want to talk about complicated, <laughs> there's complicated. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. And Very so we got from irritable bowel right into sex. I yeah. can't believe it. <laughs> My wife would say, I would know it every time that you would do that. Here's a story from late, a question from Layton, Minnesota. 55 year old woman on uh, low dose estrogen feels uh, better with her joints. Uh, how long is it safe to stay on low dose estrogen during menopause? I think a good time frame is, I mean, a max probably of five years and then try a, try a taper or try to get off the estrogen at that point to see how you do. And if you're, I mean, if you continue to have hot flashes that are moderate to severe, you may have to go back on. We wouldn't just use estrogen, you know, to treat joint pain, certainly. Um, so I think five years is a good. I think that they, that's what they are recommending. Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. CDC recommendation is as, as low dose as possible and right. as, as few Shorter. years, right. yeah, as short as, as, short as, as possible. possible. Right. Hot flashes for 50 years, flaxseed makes it better. Have you heard that one? Well, that, and that may know. be the soy base too. Yeah. I think there's some, the there's some estrogen in the, in the uh -huh. yeah, yeah, that's true. Endometriosis indicated, uh, endometriosis indicate a higher does endometriosis indicate a higher chance to develop cancer? Uh, not really. But endometriosis is what? Uh, well, when, yeah, go no, no, go, okay. go ahead. <laughs> when the lining of the uterus is growing outside the uterus, so you can have little implants of endometrial lining on your bowel or your bladder, on the top of your yeah. uterus, on your ovaries, all over. Yeah. And every time you cycle and you're, you bleed, you Those bleed little implants too. bleed yeah, too. And, and mm -hmm. the, the other place where that can be is in, inside actually the uterine wall. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I mean, I don't think that according to what I have read that increase your risk of endometrial cancer, but if, if because it's in, in between the, the muscle of the bone of the uterus, okay. maybe it, you know, the, the cancer can get spread. Mm -hmm. I think there's just inside. a very, Invasive. very slight, yes. slight very risk. Slight. I mean, endometriosis is a benign disease. Yes. It just hurts like heck. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But there is a very, very slight increased risk of cancer. From and and harder to tell. If it's growing in the lining of the uterus, then you, you would suspect that there could be cancer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sioux Falls, Botox shot for incontinence into vagina has worked really well. Have you heard that? Um, I've heard I've heard of those situations. Yes, um, there are also some injections, you know, to bulk up the urethra um, that can be done. This, so well, this is a caller feels hot flashes are part of nature, and we should just face it and embrace it. Well, that's, well, that's and an I think option. That's, a, if, that's yeah, that's yeah. what one of and, our you know if you if you live comfortable with that and it doesn't interfere with mm -hmm. your life. One of our roundtable discussion yeah, women that's true. liked her hot flashes, yeah. so that's. Is Pratique, Pristique good for hot flashes? Well, that's the same as, as, uh, as uh, Prozac, which is mm -hmm. good, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. It is. Is she at risk for osteoporosis from it? 
I no. Don't no. think so. No. And uh, I think we've got one more, had hysterectomy at age 34, took Primarin over 40 years, now she's been told to get off of it, can't sleep, and is jittery, should she go back on Primarin, or is there anything else? Well. I mean, we talked about the other options. So she could try like an Effexor to see yeah, if that works, and if it works, it. great. You know, she doesn't have the risk of clots. Or nighttime gabapentin. That's or nighttime true. gabapentin. All right, so, well, we'll be back right after this. Chug a luck, chug a luck. Makes you wanna holla, hide it all. Chug a luck, chug a luck. A checkup for colon cancer isn't all that much of a to do. A simple stool test may be all you need. But even preparing for a colonoscopy is a trifle considering the odds of getting the second most deadly cancer are 1 in 20. <laughs> An easy at-home fit test or colonoscopy. Get screened, South Dakota. Why has the healthcare industry turned so much marketing attention to women? First, women seek out medical care for themselves more often than men. Some would suggest this is due to the role women play in having babies and the medical relationships that are established to do that wonderful reproductive role. Therefore, it is no surprise her medical connections with a health care provider continue through her lifetime. And there are more reasons than having babies, which draw middle-aged women to the doctor or other health care provider. In 2004, the Kaiser Women's Health Survey interviewed 2,800 women and found that while one in 10 women of reproductive age, that's 18 to 44, say they have arthritis, hypertension, asthma, or another medical condition, Three in 10 have similar problems after reaching their middle years, 45 to 64, and six in 10 after reaching 65. The U.S. Department of Labor states that women utilize more health care than men, accounting for 60% of all expenses incurred at doctor's offices. However, it's not just her own health problems that impact her life. We also know that about 80% of the time, women are the family health care decision makers and are more likely to be the caregivers when a family member falls ill. Not always, but more often, the mother chooses the child's doctor or provider, makes the appointment, brings the child to the clinic or hospital, and then makes, makes sure follow-up care happens. And very often, She's not only coordinating this for her children, but also for her husband and for her and his elderly, frail parents. The Kaiser study found 12% of women compared to 8% of men care for a sick or aging relative. We're talking not only providing housework, transportation, and financial decisions, but also administering pills and shots, bathing and dressing, and often giving up many hours a week to bring health care to others. No wonder they're marketing to the women in her middle years. More important, however, if we're providing medical care for her, we also have to realize how often she carries the medical burden of her whole family. We talk about the sandwich generation, and that's what it is. I mean, you're kind of in the sandwich generation. You're not there yet, yeah. but um, that's a burden that women carry more than, you know, you know, 50% more than men. And even when you live very far away from your own. Oh, is that right? <laughs> yes. So you have, your family is still I in do have, life. yeah, and it's my dad. And y your father-in-law? My father-in-law, who is 92, is across the street from your father. Exactly. And so you're watching after them <laughs> from afar. Via Skype. Yeah. <laughs> By Skype. So that's a burden. Yeah. It's a, it's a, I wouldn't say it's a burden, but it's a kind of a concern, a constant worry, mm -hmm. especially if you are far away. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And how would, Ellen, how would you look at this whole picture? Well, I mean, I, I think it is a burden for women, and sometimes they, because they're, you know, like you said, they're taking care of everyone else. They don't find the time to take care of their symptoms and, yeah. um, you know, their problems until, you know, the, it's the last straw. So I think there are lots and lots of women who suffer from, um, you know, menopausal symptoms, among other things that, you know, don't 
don't get the chance to come in and treat them because they're busy with everyone else. Taking care of everybody yeah. else. Actually, yes. I mean, you are always kind of, I'll mm -hmm. do that after, right, right. afterwards. So. Right. Well, we thank you both for oh. joining us. Yeah. This brings us to the end of our show this evening. I sincerely thank our special guests who come in on the, <laughs> our beat team for our, uh, Dr. Ellen Hopper and Christina Lammers, MD, PH, MPH, for helping answer all the wonderful questions from our audience. As Gloria Steinem observed, the first problem for all of us, men and women, is not to learn, but to unlearn. Until next time, stay healthy out there, people. And I, we've got, they're gonna be looking at Funding for On Call is provided in part by... Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Broadcasting. Larson Manufacturing is proud to support On Call, starting its 11th year of opening doors for important medical information. And by... The South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota. Additional funding provided by Dakota Care, Regional Health, the Brookings Health System, Dr. Mark Bubach with Dakota Allergy and Asthma, the South Dakota American College of Physicians, and Swiftel Communications. Closed captioning for On Call is provided by the generous support of Avera, the Brookings Health System, and Fishback Financial Corporation.